John and Rick back with you, and we are welcoming in a guy who fronted a group known as the Union Gap. They had two number one hits, five top five hits, six top 15 hits, and of course, we're talking about an era where that would have been difficult to achieve. Can't wait to talk to him about that. Of course, we're talking about the inimitable Gary Puckett. Welcome to the show, Gary. Hey, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on with you guys. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, Gary, it's a pleasure to uh, to have you here. You're going to be coming to West Michigan to the uh, the Tulip Festival, and we look forward to, to having you here and uh, getting a chance to, to see your fans here. How, how often do you get to, uh, to Michigan, Gary? Well, you know, we've been to Michigan a few times, I think. We were just recently, we were in the upper, we had to, we had to fly to Wisconsin to get there. We drove to <laughs> upper Michigan. Okay. You know, up <laughs> you almost couldn't get there from here, one of those. It was a long way. I forget where it was right now, but it was fantastic. There was um, lots of snow and uh, a lot of wonderful people up there. All right, we're going to take things just a little bit chronologically. Your very first hit, of course, was Woman, Woman. You took it all the way to number three in 1967. Because it was such an early success, did you kind of look around the room and say, hmm, this was a little easier than we thought? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know in retrospect if I thought it was that easy. Um, it, it took a little while for that record to actually get onto the charts because you guys will remember that we used to have A and B sides on records, sure. which meant that the radio station could choose which side they wanted to play. And we had recorded a song called Don't Make Promises You Can't Keep, uh, which was a Tim Harden song. And some markets were um, playing Woman, Woman, and other markets were playing uh, Don't Make Promises, which, as you know, sort of dilutes one side or the other. So it wasn't until, um, gosh, it was late in, uh, very late in 67, when there was a disc jockey program director in Columbus, Ohio, who was a Civil War buff, mm. and he loved the idea when he saw the picture on the Woman Woman record uh, that, uh, that we wore the Civil War outfits. So he said, I wonder what this sounds like. And he put it on his radio station. Oh, actually, he auditioned it first and then put it on the station as a pick-to-click because he loved the record and the picture. And uh, from there, we started to really build. Before that, it was getting spotted kind of play around the country. How did you develop that idea of choosing to wear the period costumes? Well, it wasn't so much a development as it was just simply a bright idea all of a sudden because I kept thinking to myself, you know, all of us here in this era are wearing leathers, tie-dyes, fringes, uh, paisleys, hip-huggers, bell-bottoms, etc. You remember the, the garb well, I'm sure. <laughs> and, um, you know, I thought, gee, you, you, we, we, need to, we need to not only sound great, but we need to look great and maybe make some sort of a statement. And uh, you probably also remember that in those days there were about 500 records per month, you know, going out to all the radio stations which meant that really with only a top 40 for most stations, how many records were really going to have a shot at it? And I thought if I've got something visual that can catch somebody's eye, that may help us, you know, have kind of a leg up, so to speak, you know, in relation to a hit record, if we've got what in fact sounds like a hit record to somebody. And it did to this gentleman at uh, WCOL in Columbus, and that's what got it started. Uh, So it took some months, actually, and it took a lot of, uh, you know, going out and driving around with the Columbia regional people up in Cleveland and meeting people and shaking hands and, you know, doing that promotional thing. Talking to uh, Gary Puckett. Gary, who were some of your, your early uh, musical influences? Well, certainly Elvis was one of the biggest. Um, always loved the man's music and uh, all the people along the way right there, the Everly Brothers, Jerry Lee Lewis, uh, the Coasters, the Platters, Fats Domino, Little Richard, uh, you know, I was kind of a rock and roll fan. But I still remember people like Pat Boone and and um, others, you know, that created pop hits of the day. Now, you were a contemporary of, of course, the Beatles and the whole British Invasion thing, so you're you're competing, the Union Gap and yourself competing directly head-to-head with, with that whole uh, mess of, uh, of stuff and obviously held your own very well. Talk to us about what it was like back in that time of, uh, of music, uh, talking the, the early to mid-60s. Well, it just was a wonderful period in time. I mean, as you remember, the country was in great upheaval with the Vietnam War. Um, and, you know, from 1967 until about 74, they were trying to end the doggone thing, you know. And it was not a popular war. No wars are. But it was uh, creating a lot of uh, strife in the nation. And, of course, you know, we go through all our different en- energy crunches and everything else. But when it came to the music part of it, I was able to just sort of forget about everything else, you know, and bury myself in the 
in the excitement of what the music scene was all about, you know, and I loved the British Invasion. I was a huge, still am a huge Beatles fan, and I loved all of that um, that British music. There, it had a sound, it had a an intent and purpose, you know, and it was uh, for me so much fun um, to be involved in it and to uh, to be a part of it. You met up, of course, with uh, Jerry uh, Fuller. He was a uh, CBS uh, uh, record producer and, and also a songwriter. And, you know, Rick was talking about Woman, Woman. Uh, I think he penned that song for you. So that was a, uh, to start out with, that was a good marriage for, for uh, you and, and, and Jerry. I mean, a professional marriage, obviously. Absolutely professional, perfect marriage. It was wonderful. Um, I had put together a portfolio that had pictures of the band in our new outfits and and a, a demo that really wasn't the Union Gap playing, but it was me singing. Um, and I had put lyrics in there as well, handwritten, you know, and took it around all the record companies. But when I walked into to CBS, um, Jerry had uh, been newly hired as a staff producer, and they believed in him because he had already written um, Traveling Man for Ricky Nelson, and he had done some other productions that were really really terrific i believe one of those was uh the knickerbockers lies do you remember that record absolutely i, love I it. thought it was the beatles you know it was just it was one of those <laughs> stunning records to me and i walked in his office and he was kind of you know preparing to get started so he was hanging his gold records on the wall and things and one of those was the <laughs> award for, for ricky nelson you know and i stood there looking at it and and of course you know me a brand new youngster in the business trying to get a start you know i was totally impressed with that i showed him my portfolio and he loved what he saw and heard and he asked where he could see the band so i told him that we were from san diego working in a club called the quad room and he says i'm going to come down and see you on saturday night actually he showed up on friday to catch me off guard and he really did so i almost didn't recognize him when he walked up to the stage but he just looked at me and said hey you know and i, I yeah i took me a second and he says let's go make a record so that was that part was real simple, you know. But um, truth is, Jerry did not write "Woman, Woman." He oh. already had that song in his hands. Okay, it was recorded by a group called Tom Paul and the Glazer Brothers, uh, country act from Nashville. Oh, sure, we and, know them. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you do. And uh, Jerry uh, loved the song, and he and Glenn Campbell were very good friends at that point. I'm I'm certain they still are, but. Um, uh, Glenn had told him that he was going to record that song as soon as he got into the studio, and Jerry said, as soon as I find the singer for this song, I'm recording it. So ultimately, uh, I found Jerry. Jerry invited Glenn, and Glenn came over and played uh, acoustic guitar on Woman, Woman. And uh, then Jerry wrote Young Girl as a follow-up. He wrote Lady Willpower as a follow-up. He wrote Over You as a follow-up, and in that year, we um, we were pretty big. I mean, in this country, really caught on in the U.K., I think a couple of, had a, a couple of different lives over there. I mean, it hit originally, and I think you were able to reissue it years later. But that song also caused a, a bit of a controversy, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Only because we had censorship uh, in the United States at that point in time, you know, and, and people were real concerned about what was on the airwaves, but it's all in interpretation, because if you look at the song and want to take that as a moral and upright kind of lyric, you can do that, and that's the way that I always looked at it. I never looked at it in a lascivious mm -hmm. way. To me, it was always, hey, you told me that you were old enough to fall in love. And therefore, you you you, you lied to me. You got to go away. Yeah. So that's the way that I sure. Saw just it. a cautionary tale makes complete sense. Yeah, <laughs> that's, right. that's correct. Because you've been touring all of these years, have you been on some bills and performed along with some folks that you really enjoyed being with? Oh, absolutely. Throughout the years, I just have had the opportunity to work with absolutely everybody. You know, at mm -hmm. least from our genre, and sometimes from other genres as well. For instance, recently we did a a cruise which was done by concerts at sea and of course paul revere and the raiders uh, were the you know the main part of the bill um uh, chuck negron from three dog night i i lovingly call him one dog light uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's a nice guy and you know still sounds great and he's got a great band and of course uh, i was there with my band and also the um the original comets. Now, there's only two of them left because they're getting pretty old and mm. and dying off. But um, that's the sort of thing, you know. And through the years, I get to work with everybody from Tommy James to the Turtles to the Association to the Buckinghams to 
uh, B.J. Thomas, for instance, who uh, I'll be on this bill with. That's going to be fun. Have you performed with B.J. before? And coincidentally, the two of you were born just about eight to ten weeks apart, so fun there. Oh, is that right? I didn't know yeah. that part. Yes, I have performed with B.J. many, many times. He's a great guy and has a great band, and we have a, a great uh, symbiotic, is that the right word, sure. sort of relationship. <laughs> you know, we we work well together on stage, uh, you know, equipment-wise and all that, and... Uh, it's terrific. He's great, and, and we enjoy to work together. Probably expect something different one of these days. You'll come out and say, hey, we're going to switch it up th- tonight. We're each going to sing the other songs. <laughs> I would love to do that. I bet you would. In fact, BJ resists it a little bit, but <laughs> one of these days I'll talk him into it. <laughs> oh, man. Well, that, that's great. You took a little time off from, from the music business in the 70s to kind of get into, uh, I guess, acting and uh, singing and dancing. Oh, well, you're always a singer, but, I mean, uh, acting and, and, and a little bit of dance uh, theater out in uh, what, L.A., I guess, huh? In the Los Angeles yeah. area, yeah. It was a good uh, training ground for me. I, I studied dance for about two and a half years, and I studied philosophy, which then, you know, was a carryover from the 60s and all that uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi <laughs> kind of TM stuff, you know, and all that. And, of course, got into nutritional aspects of life and, and exercise and all that, and, and it was a great growing period. It was not a very rewarding period as far as, as music and things like that. I did a lot of writing. I produced, I wrote and produced an album in 74 and 75 that everybody can find at my website, which is garypucketmusic.com. But I call it The Lost Tapes because my brother wrote the lyrics, I wrote the music, and then I produced the album and took it to all the record companies, even took it to uh, to England, and everybody sort of turned their nose up at it. Uh, saying, this isn't the Gary Puckett we know, it isn't the Gary Puckett we want, so we pass, you know, and uh, so I kind of lost the tapes through the years of, you know, moving from residence to residence and stuff like that, and when I got to Florida about six years ago, I found the tape, and I said, I wonder what this sounds like 30-odd years later, you know, so I put on my earphones, and I listened, and I thought, gee, that's really good, and then I went, well, wait a minute, am I being objective here? Uh, you know, I, I was so personally involved with that maybe i better listen again so i did i listened again just closed my eyes sat there and listened i was so struck with what i heard that i decided that i'd take it out of the analog domain and you know make a cd out of it and and uh, i have not heard one person say they didn't like the album so anybody has a has a gary pocket collection they need to have that tape Fantastic. Or CD, I should say. You bet. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming uh, you got a website. Uh, can folks go on uh, on there and order some of your stuff? It's GaryPucketMusic.com. Okay. Also, I'll have it with me probably at the show there, too. Fantastic. Yeah, that is such a, a double-edged sword, and as we talk to especially the classic uh, acts, uh, Gary, of, of uh, you know, the, the you know, you're still trying to do something a little new and different, but yet, you know, you tried, as you said, you know, all of a sudden people want, oh, we want the, the you know, we want the old Gary Puckets. That, that, that's 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 kind of tough to deal with sometimes, isn't it? Well, yes and no. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm very, very fortunate that I was able to uh, have enough hit records at that point in time that I've been able to make a career out of it. You know, I've been yeah. able to sustain life and to enjoy, and, and I've got a wonderful, beautiful little family, and we have a, a great place to live, and I'm very grateful for all of that. So I understand that what the people really want is is Union Gap. When I come out on stage, they want to hear mostly Union Gap stuff, and they allow me to take a little bit of a left or a right turn, you know, in order to to satisfy my own uh, <laughs> musical desires, whatever. But uh, in the long run, I know it's all about making memories and all about um, looking back, you know, when I go out in front of the people. So that's what I try to focus on. And it's got to be neat to, to see uh, some of the old fans, and I'm sure some of the new fans, too. I know in this business, Rick and I, you know, we're always thrilled when the 20-somethings or 30-somethings call in and want to want to request because, they're you know, they're just discovering maybe your music for the first time, you know, some, you know, 40 years after it was originally cut. So that's always exciting. Do you find that that, that mix in your audience as well? I do, and I'm so pleased. I always ask when I can see that somebody is less than 30 years old, I'll ask them how old they are. And they could be 25, they could be 15. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask them, how did you discover this music? Uh, You know, and they'll say, well, I didn't, I don't like the music of my era so much, so I push the buttons and I look. And I found the music of this era, and I absolutely love it, you know. And I always tell them, I just love when the young people of America love what us old guys do, you know, because, <laughs> because 
because it's just terrific to see them, you know, young people to old people. I, I see people that are 20 years older than me to, um, you know, to, to teenagers. And Gary, since you're mentioning your music and young people, I've always wanted to relate a story to you that happened during my 11th year, 1968. I had been taken rather against my will to the state of Arkansas, and it was dreary, it was lonely, it was miserable, but the year of 68 was a huge year for the Union Gap, and it did a lot to get me through that summer, and I'm glad to thank you. Well, that's really neat, and I remember being in Birmingham. Is that where you were? I was in a place called Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, where few travelers go. Somebody once told me it was a resort town. I called it a last resort town. <laughs> it was 97 it just, degrees uh, every uh, day. <laughs> that's great. It just reminded me of doing a concert, I, and I don't know what made me think of Birmingham, but uh, it was one of our first, in fact, our very first trip to the south. Um, and we, of course, were wearing our northern outfit. Oh, yeah. So we had, uh, <laughs> yeah, we had obtained somewhere uh, a pretty good sized Confederate flag and we rolled it up and then we sort of draped it across the piano while it was rolled up. And when we walked out on stage, one of us walked to either side of the flag and grabbed the, you know, the opposite ends of it and we unfurled it for the 7,000 people that were there. And they let out with this rebel yell. I thought, okay, fine, we're in. Okay, good. <laughs> that was very clever because I had never thought of traveling <laughs> yeah. to the South in that in those period costumes. Very clever. You bet. Yeah. Well, I was so nervous by the whole thing that I sang the second verse to Woman Woman <laughs> first, and I got many many letters saying, "We love your song, but please learn the lyrics to it." <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> it's all great performers. Uh, Gary, I'll tell you what, thanks for taking some, some time to, to chat with us. We look forward to seeing you in Holland, and uh, it's been great having you on the show. Well, it's been absolutely terrific talking with you guys, and I'll look forward to seeing you there in Holland. So uh, I'm hoping to, to meet you face-to-face. -face. We look forward to that. Gary Puckett and B.J. Thomas, what an amazing build together. Central Wesleyan Auditorium. John and I, of course, have seen several shows there, and there is not a bad seat in the house, is there, you John? You bet. It's a great place, great venue. May 13th. Very much looking forward to it. It's Friday the 13th. It's going to be all good luck for our <laughs> listeners as we'll all get to troop down there together the Tulip Time Festival with these two outstanding gentlemen. Thanks again, Gary. Thank hey, you. Hey, you're welcome. God bless. Hey, you're welcome. God bless. Hey, you're welcome. God bless.